Lord, I pray that you uh, give us wisdom and help us just understand who you are more intimately. In Jesus' name, amen. So there's several questions that were asked um, via text message by Rhett this week. Um, and one thing we need to know, our brains, they want to make sense of things, okay? They have this huge desire to, to make sense of things. So we're going to be talking about some things like this. What, um, these are the questions that, that are asked. Is God the Father Jesus? Is, no, is God the Father greater than Jesus? Are they the same person? But that's not even the questions that were asked of me. Let me see if I can find Rhett's text messages. The question is about the Trinity. The word Trinity is not found anywhere in the Bible. So why do we believe in the Trinity? You know, And what is the Trinity? And Well, let's just say the Trinity is a little bit of a mystery. Always has been. Some people think they've got it figured out, but I don't think you can really get it figured out. It's just shrouded in mystery, especially if you're reading only in English. If you read only in English, you're going to still be in the dark about certain things. I've heard people say, I've read the Bible and I've never heard Jesus claim to be God. And they're correct. In English, he didn't claim to be God. And... There is something, I just read it, because um, it's something I've struggled with too, trying to understand. I heard people say, oh, when God said, when Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am, he was saying that he was God. Um, but still, that doesn't prove that he's God. You know, there's some people that believe that Jesus is an angel. And if he's an angel, then that statement's also true, right? Before Abraham was, I am. That means he was, he predated Abraham. He could have been an angelic being, a heavenly host, Right? Um, do I totally understand that? I don't know. I mean, I can tell you right now, if we talked about the sons of God in the Old Testament, it says the devil came, Satan came before God, the book of Job, uh, amongst the sons of God. Or who are the sons of God? Well, those sons of God were another, other angelic heavenly hosts. So is, is Jesus a son of God in that way? Like he's an angel? Like he's some sort of uh, heavenly being that came down and he is the only begotten son. In other words, there's other sons, but he's the only one that was begotten, which means that he came out of a woman. You see what I'm saying? Um, then there's people who say, oh, the sons of God are actually just, you know, believers. But, um, but it's just kind of weird because scriptures make it sound a little bit more like sons of God have to do with angelic beings. <clears throat> right? So, it's very interesting. We do know that Jesus was in the beginning, because the book of John, John chapter 1, says in the beginning was the Word, the Word was God, the Word was with God, and by Him all things were made, and then that Word became flesh. So, John chapter 1 makes it very clear, from John's perspective, the writer, right? He's the one writing this, right? and we believe it's by the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, John wrote that Jesus was God. Right there, period. Like, it's clear. G the, the disciple who walked with Jesus proclaimed that he was God. Okay? <clears throat> but then the question is, does Jesus ever say that he's God? Right? right. So, there's this thing um, in the Greek. The reason why I erased this. Uh, can you give me a, the black marker that's in the top drawer there? in my desk. Can y'all see that? Yeah. Solacism. I think this is what it's called. Um, let me just Google the word. Okay, so if you go to Revelation chapter 1, I think it's verse, uh, let's go there. Uh, we got a Bible? All right. 
Okay, it's Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Okay. Jesus appears before John the Baptist, not John the Baptist, John the Apostle in the book of Revelation. He appears to him in a vision. He says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, says the Lord God, who is and who was and who is to come, the Almighty. Let's just read it. John to the seven churches that are in Asia, grace to you and peace from him who is and who was. Oh, it is verse 4. Verse 4 and 8. Okay. <clears throat> right, so there's a clear distinction here. What you need to know is there is a very clear distinction between the Father and the Son. Okay? That Jesus submits to the Father, and we know this because of John chapter 14, verse 28. Okay, let's go over to John 14, verse 20, 28. Um, he says, you heard me say to you, I'm going away, and I will come to you. If you loved me, you would have rejoiced because I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. All right? So there's a clear distinction here. We know this, this Jesus said, flat out, Jesus said this, right? This is not a disciple's interpretation. This is not a, <clears throat> you know, a, another church saying this. This is not... A school of thought, right? No, this is Jesus saying very clearly, I'm going to the Father, for the Father is greater than I. Okay, so we know, we know the Father is greater than him. Okay? Because Jesus said so. John 14, verse 28. Then 1 Corinthians... First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 27 28 says for the scriptures say God has put all things under his authority of course when it says all things under his authority that does not include God himself who gave Christ his authority then when all things are under his authority, the Son will put himself under God's authority, so that God, who gave his Son authority over all things, will be utterly supreme over everything everywhere. So, again, here's another... This is Now, this is Paul writing, okay? <clears throat> so this is something that was taught that the first apostles all understood, right? But they also believed that he was God. But they also all believed that he submitted to God the Father. Make sense? Mm. Did he, but he did that willfully, right? Yes, of course. <clears throat> um, when people ask me, well, how can God be, the Father, be greater than Jesus if they are one? Well, if you go to John chapter 17... We need to explain something here because John chapter 17 talks about how, how he says, may they all be one, right? Is my Bible inside my bag? It would be so much easier. Appreciate you, Dre. That way I can flip quickly. All right, John chapter 17 it says, when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his, heavens, his eyes to heaven this is after he'd already told him he was about to go to the Father, and the Father was greater than him in John chapter 14. It's all in one conversation. And then John chapter 17 is his high priestly prayer. It's one of the most amazing passages in the Bible. It just blows all kinds of theology out of the water, uh, doctrines and things like God gets all the glory. That's, that's debunked here in chapter 17. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not saying God doesn't get all the glory. I am saying that <clears throat> he's not the only one who gets the glory. And that needs to be understood. You know, we're given glory by God himself, um, by the, by G through Jesus. All right? So <clears throat> when Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted up his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your son that the son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. Now, this is very clear, right? So... I have a question. To believe that the Father is greater than the Son 
does that violate how you get saved? It doesn't violate how you get saved. Because according to this, Jesus is also teaching right now, since you have given him, who? Christ, the Father, has given Christ the authority over all flesh to give eternal to whom you have given him, right? So the, the, uh, the Jesus is the one who saves. Now that's interesting, right? He's the one who gives eternal life. And this is eternal life that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. Now he is again clearly making a distinction between the two. That you may knew that, that you may, they may know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ whom you've sent. Right? So it's a pair. You have to know the Father, and you have to know the one whom he sent, which is Jesus Christ. I glorified you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. So how do you bring glory to God? Accomplishing the work that he gave you to do. Mm. Having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence. Watch this. Glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. Now, that's kind of weird because it makes it sound kind of like he doesn't have the same glory he had before. Yeah. Something happened when the world was created that made the glory of Christ lessen, which is very weird to well, say. When he came here to be a human, he, he stepped down from his glory. Right. We do know that he humbled himself to the point of the servant. Yeah. So he also took off his own glory. Yeah. But... He is not saying, give me back the glory that, you get, that I had before I came here. Right? He's saying, give me the glory I had before the world began. So there's another, maybe he did take off his glory. Well, we do know this. First Peter says, before the foundations of the world, Christ was chosen. So it could be that, he, that there's a glory that he, he lost even at the beginning of the earth. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Because if he was chosen at the beginning of the earth to become the suffering servant, then this could have been something that's been in the works all along, right? That we don't understand. Verse 6, I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you. For I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in truth that I am from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I am not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and all and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Okay, so how does God receive the Father receive glory? He receives glory because of what Jesus did, because of the work he came to accomplish. How does Jesus get glory? Through us. I am glorified in them. How is he glorified? Whenever we are saved, he is glorified. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world, and I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name, which you have given me. So now we're, make, we're seeing that God has given Jesus his name, that they may be one, even as we are one. Now, he's saying that the Christians, the believers, will become one even as we are one. Who's we? God the Father, God the Son. So he wants Shane and Marcus and Matt and Dre and Rhett and me to all be one, just like the Father and the Son are one. Now, does that mean that we are the same person? What does it mean? The only, the same spirit. The only illustration I can really see that really matches perfectly with this or the per as perfect as possible, is marriage. The Bible says the two shall become one flesh, right? Now, that's a physical, like they actually become one flesh, but they're two different people. How are, how are they still one? It's the same mystery. The mystery of marriage is still the same. It's the same mystery of the Trinity to a certain level, okay? Just like it's almost impossible for us to understand how a man and a woman can become one person, how can the Father and the Son become one being? Does that make sense? Um, but we are. But he's saying here that they should be one. 
Now, now, does that mean that we're all one flesh? I don't know. I don't know if that means that we're all one flesh. It just means that we're one, right? Whatever that one is, whatever that means, that unity, okay? The Father and the Son are also one as we are one. Make sense? While I was with them, verse 12, I kept them in your name, which you have given me. I've guarded them, and not one of them has been lost except the son of destruction that the scriptures might be fulfilled. He's talking about Judas. But now I'm coming to you, and these things I speak in, your, in the world that they may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as, I'm, as I am not of the world. That's ironic, because it's easy for us to see how Jesus is not of the world, right? He came from heaven, and he came, we, you know, we believe that he was God, made man, right? He became flesh, right? So it's easy for you and me to understand that he didn't come from earth. He came from heaven, he came to the earth, right? And that the earth is not his home. And now he's saying that we are not of the world either which means there's a part of us that came from heaven. Make sense? Something about us didn't come from this earth. It came from heaven. Sanctify them in the word and the truth. Your word is truth. As you sent me into the world, so I have sent them into the world. And for their sake, I consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified in truth. Consecrate means to be set apart for holy use. So he's actually talking about himself being consecrated. What he means by that is he's about to die. He's about to be set apart like a sacrifice, like an animal sacrifice in the Old Testament. And then be consecrated. I'm going to consecrate myself that they also may be sanctified. Consecration and sanctification are almost the same thing. Okay? He's going to consecrate so we can be sanctified. What does that mean? That means that we're going to be set apart also as a living sacrifice in truth. Verse 20. I do not ask for these only. So now he's not just praying for the disciples, yes, sir? Good. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word. They may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us. Okay. Now, we're getting weird because we believe, what I've been taught, is the Father and the Son are one, which means that they're the same person, right? That's what we've been taught. I like to stick to just the Word, just what the Word says, and I, sometimes we shouldn't read into it. Sometimes we just read it the way it is, okay? That they also may be in us. What does that mean? If the Father and the Son are one... We're talking Trinity unity, whatever that is. He's telling us, he's telling God in the prayer that he wants us to be one with him like he's one with the Father. Now, I don't get that. I don't understand. Are you telling me we're going to be God? Because if Jesus is one with the Father and that makes him God, does that mean that if I become one with the Father that I become God? And nobody would agree to that. Right? Right? <laughs> nobody would believe that but it's a preconceived idea now, when you read your scriptures you got to be careful about your preconceived ideas you already have a belief system okay when we read the bible we already have a belief system so when we read the bible we like to interpret it within our belief system that can be dangerous especially if our belief system isn't right okay so if i believe that the Father and the Son means that they're one and the same exact person, then that means when I read this, I'm going to also believe that when we become one, we become this exact same person. Does that make sense? It's a little bit tricky and a little bit mysterious. So I don't think it means that we're God, right? Now, then there's other people in the, in the charismatic movement will say, well, we are gods. Jesus said we were gods, right? Well, that gets a little dangerous, too, and a little hairy, you know? So then we're going to get into the point where what's, what's God's? You know, is if mankind is a form of a God, angels are also a form of a God, and God's God, God. You see what I'm saying? I think really the truth is it has to come down to authority. 
when we start looking at these scriptures, you, you can't, like when we say, oh, I am, if somebody is to say, I'm God, or I'm a God, right? Because we are gods. If we say that, then people will automatically assume that if you say you're like a God, then you've got this great authority. Well, first of all, you do have a great authority on the earth. God's given you authority over the earth. Yeah. Right? But he hasn't given me authority over Jesus. And he definitely hasn't given me authority over the Father. Right? So when we look at it as authority, in lines of authority, it's the God the Father, God the Son, and the Holy Spirit. I don't know where he is. I haven't understood that yet. <laughs> but he's, he's in there. <laughs> he's in the Godhead. But we do know the Father's over the Son. Jesus said so clearly. And then the Bible says that we will send the Holy Spirit. We also know very clearly that it was the Father who raised the Son from the dead. Jesus did not raise himself from the dead. Let's find that scripture just so that we can be clear on that. Yeah, Well, there's a two, two different scriptures. Look at, look, look at this. This is interesting. Romans chapter 6 and Romans chapter 8. All right, Romans chapter 6, verse 10. We, sh we are sure of this because Christ was raised from the dead and he will never die again. Death no longer has any power over him. When he died, he died once to break the power of sin, but now he lives. He lives for the glory of God. So you also should consider yourselves to be dead to the power of sin and all alive to God through Christ Jesus. Do not let sin control the way you live. Do not sin give in to sinful desires. Do not let any part of the body become an instrument of evil to serve sin. Okay, so that is not... Well, 8.11 is uh, for sure... Um, the Spirit of God who raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Okay, so this one says Spirit, the Spirit of God. Okay? <clears throat> Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. The Spirit of God, this is verse 10 and 11. Romans 8, verse 10 and 11. Sorry. Um, and Christ lives within you, so even though your body will die because of sin, the Spirit gives you life because you have been made right with God. I believe he's talking about today, right now. When you give your life to Christ, you die with, you die with Christ, but the reason why you're still alive is because the Holy Spirit keeps you alive. That's what I, I, when I first read that, that's how I interpreted it the first time. Um, <clears throat> but then again, I don't know. I don't know if that's true or not. It's just interesting. The Spirit of God, who raised Jesus from the dead, lives in you. Wait a minute. Do you see that? So we, we see, oh, the Spirit of God that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. So we see here that the Spirit of God raised Jesus from the dead. Okay? And just as God raised Christ Jesus from the dead, He will give life to your mortal bodies by this same Spirit living within you. Okay? So, apparently, it's still the Father who raised Jesus from the dead by the Holy Spirit. <laughs> anyway, interesting. Um, oh, Romans 6.4. Romans 6.4. For we died. Oh, yeah, yeah. This is it. For we died and were buried with Christ by baptism, and just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glorious power of the Father, now we also may live new lives. Romans chapter 6, verse 4, and Acts chapter 2, verse 32. Acts chapter 2, verse 32. <clears throat> God raised Jesus from the dead, and we are all witnesses of this. Now he exalted to the place he is exalted to the place of the highest honor in heaven at God's right hand and the father as he has promised gave him the holy spirit to pour out onto us. So look at that. So God gave the holy spirit to Jesus and Jesus gave the holy spirit to us. Look at it. Look at it right there. That's pretty cool. Just as you see in here today, for David himself never ascended into heaven, yet he said, the Lord said to my Lord, sit in the place of honor at my right hand and until I humble your enemies. I'm hoping my wife will come here with that book. 
Um, so anyway, th does that help? Does that help make things even messier? <laughs> yeah. You got a, you got a question popping up now, Matt? No. Oh. All right. So, does that make sense? Is that clear as mud? Clear as mud. All right. So, here's the point. I wasn't trying to confuse everybody. Well, you did. Uh. <laughs> here's what you need to know. We do believe Jesus is God, and I'm waiting for my wife to get here with my book, because in that book, it's got this really interesting thing to say about something called a solecism. What is solecism? Okay, so let me just tell you what a solecism is, and um, this is something I've learned in school, and I wish I could just have the actual references. Um, uh, so whenever Jesus said, the thing is, I'm nervous to say what I'm about to say, because I, I have to prove it to myself before I can teach it. You know, everything I'm talking about is in the Bible, but uh, but it's okay. So here's the thing: <clears throat> I was using this scripture and I was wrong. That's my point. So uh, I was going to use this scripture, but that didn't make it clearer that Jesus was God. It just pointed out that God was God. It wasn't pointing out that Jesus was God. So this one didn't work for me. And the book was when I read the book the other day. It was making it sound like it was Jesus. That's why I hate books that don't. Uh, make this frustrating me like i want to know clearly and I'm, I'm reading it for myself all right um well unless you don't know greek because then sometimes it helps okay so this solecism the solecism is a grammatical error okay <clears throat> now um it, writers will use certain y'all ever re, hear about mark twain and how he wrote his books right and he wrote his books intentionally grammatically incorrect Right? <clears throat> he was adding slang and he was saying ain't and all that, right? So <clears throat> he was writing the way people talked yeah. in his books, okay? And it was intentional. He wrote it like that on purpose. It wasn't like he was dumb. It wasn't like he didn't know how to write. No, he wrote intentionally that way. Now, most of his book was like that, right? Most of his dialogue sections were like that. <clears throat> but whenever we read um, in, the, in, the, in the scriptures, there's also some interesting... Um, interesting things that they do in the Bible to prove certain points, okay? So one of those things is a solecism, uh, which is a, gra a solecism of the word I am, okay? Now, <clears throat> are y'all familiar with the Greek lexicon? Not a lexicon, the Greek Septuagint. Okay. 333 B.C., that's actually probably not completely accurate. It's around 300 B.C. to about 150 B.C., okay? That's when the, uh, the Hebrew was translated into the Greek. That's when they translated the Hebrew Bible into Greek, okay? And it's called the Septuagint. Um, they, took the, they took the most important books the first year. They came back, and miraculously, they were all word for word. Seventy different scholars went their own ways came back and they were all translated miraculously, same word for word, Greek. That's what legend says, okay? Um, <clears throat> well, the septa, the word septent means 70. So there was 70 scholars, so they call it the Septuagint, okay? Another uh, shortened version of this is just LXX, okay? So if you see LXX, that means Septuagint because L means 50 in Roman numerals and X means 10. So this is the word the number seventy, if I'm not mistaken. Can somebody make sure I'm right about that? Seventy. I think it's right. So anyway, they translated this the Bible into that. Now, when they did that, <clears throat> they translated the word "I am" differently in Exodus chapter three. Yeah. It is. Yeah. Okay, good. I got that right. Exodus chapter three. Whenever Moses was inside the burning, was talking to the burning bush, right? Talking to God through the burning bush. He, uh, he says, he says, what will I say? What's the name? What's your name? So I can tell the people, you know, who, who, who should I say sent me? He says, tell them I am sent you. So the word, when they translated it <clears throat> from Hebrew into Greek, they translated it a certain way. Okay. And 
in the New Testament. So if I, so when we lose a student every once in a while at the barracks, I'll come in and I'll, you know, to lighten the mood because, you know, it really stinks when students leave. Uh, you know, it hurts, to be honest with you. Um, but as a way to just kind of like lighten the mood, we come in there and sing that old song and another one bites the dust, right? <laughs> so if I come in there and sing that song to you, everybody in the room knows exactly what happened, right? That song is a little bit lighthearted, but it's also just, you know, a, one, a coping mechanism for dealing with somebody who left. Make sense? So, but, but I'm, I'm quoting a song that everybody can relate with. Does it make sense? We all get it. It's understood. So the authors in the Bible did the same thing. They would write certain things and say it a certain way, and everybody who read that would know what he's talking about. Does that make sense? It was alluding to something else. It's called an illusion, a literary illusion. Not illusion, illusion. It alludes. It points back to something else. Allude. So <clears throat> whenever, if I'm not mistaken, whenever, and this is where I'm going to have to double check my stuff, okay, uh, Dre. But in the book of Revelation, chapter 1, that I was reading to you, John the writer did the same thing. He said, I am the one who was, who is, and who is to come. And he used that phrase, the same Greek phrase that's used in Exodus chapter 3 to say, I am. When he says, I am has sent you. So when he said, I am, when he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega, the one who is, the one who was, and the one who is to come, scholars have read that and said, what is wrong with John's grammar here? This is not the right way to write this phrase. In Greek, it's wrong. Well, only those who understood the Greek lexicon, or the Greek, uh, I keep saying lexicon. Lexicon's like a study book, not the actual uh, uh, Septuagint. I keep mixing up my words. When they, when they would read the Septuagint, they would see that phrase, I am, in Greek. Well, it's said the same way in Exodus chapter 3, in Revelation chapter 1, I am. Does it make sense? So he wrote, it's called a solecism. It's an intentional grammatical error meant to invoke thought, meant to make you think of something else. Does it make sense? So he did, he did the same thing whenever, whenever Jesus said, before Abraham was, I am. He did the same thing. So what does that mean? <clears throat> that means that Jesus was speaking in a way that everyone around them would understand that when he said the word, I am, he was actually proclaiming to be Yahweh. Okay? And this is the reason why the disciples believed he was God, because he would say those things. Now, what's interesting about this is, <clears throat> why do we think this is, why, how can we not explain this away? Let's just go there. Before Abraham was, I am. Before Abraham was, I am. John chapter 8, verse 48. <clears throat> the people were retorted, You Samaritan devil, didn't we say all along that you were possessed by a demon? No, Jesus said, I have no demon in me, for I honor my Father and you dishonor me. And though I have no wish to glorify myself, God is gl going to glorify me. Y'all realize that Jesus never sought his own glory? He is the true judge. I tell you the truth, anyone who obeys my teaching will never die. And people said, now we know you are possessed by a demon. Even Abraham and the prophets died. But you say anyone who obeys my teaching will never die. Are you greater than our father Abraham who died and did so to the prophets? Who do you think you are? Jesus answered, if I want glory for myself, it doesn't count. But if it is my father who will glorify me, you say he is our God, but you don't even know him. I know him. If I said otherwise, I would be a gr as great a liar as you. But I, do not know, but I do know him and obey him. Your father, Abraham, rejoiced as he looked forward to my coming. He saw it and was glad. The people said, you aren't even 50 years old. How can you say you have seen Abraham? Jesus answered, I tell you the truth. Before Abraham was even born, I am. At that point, they picked up stones to throw at him, because, but Jesus was hidden from them and left the temple. Now, 
Why would someone want to pick up stones to kill somebody for just saying a simple phrase like, before Abraham was, I am? Unless, I mean, if they thought he was crazy, oh, you're only 50 years old, you know? No, they didn't think he was crazy. They thought he was a heretic. You know what I'm saying? Because of what he said. It wasn't like he was being crazy. You know what I'm saying? I mean, they were saying, they were trying to, they were trying to give him some sort of mercy. Think about it. Verse 48. You Samaritan devil, didn't we say all along you were possessed by a demon? They thought he was possessed by a demon. He was saying some crazy stuff. And now he says, before Abraham was, I am. But when he said that, it was not just a crazy phrase. It wasn't just like, yeah, I was alive before Abraham. I know that I look less than 50 years old, but I was alive before. He didn't, it wasn't like he was saying he was alive before Abraham. No, he was saying before Abraham was, I am. Okay? And that phrase, let's come down here and look at it. Now, this one at the bottom says, some manuscripts say, uh, no, it says, and before Abraham was even born, I have always been alive. Um, but the Greek reads, before Abraham was, I am, see Exodus chapter 3, verse 14, okay? So when he says, I am, it's, it's, a, it's they call it the imago Deo, okay? Let me see if I can find it, which just means image of God, so I don't know if that's right or not. Jesus said to them, verily I say to you, before Abraham was, I am. The phrase I am in John 5, 8, 58 comes from the two Greek words, ego and ami. Okay. Um, the Strong's definition are ego, I, only expressed when emphatic, or me. Emmy, I exist, used only when emphatic, am, have been X, it is, I was. I'm looking here. Well, this article doesn't help me. Anyway, this is what they teach you in Bible school. Uh, talking about the phrase I am is in reference to Exodus chapter 3, verse 14. So, um, I'll have to find another, a better, a better one here. I'll find a better way to explain it. What's the, uh, next question. Are the dead already in heaven? Okay. You ready for this one? <laughs> All right, so there's one scripture that says, to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay? So let's find that scripture. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Uh, 2 um, Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. I'm not going to give the answer people like, probably. Um, so it's right here. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 8. Yes, we are fully confident and we would rather be away from these earthly bodies for then we will be at home with the Lord. So whether we are in here or we are here in his in, the, in this body or away from this body, our goal is to please him. For we must all stand before Christ to be judged. Before Christ to be judged. We will each receive whatever we deserve for the good or evil we have done in this earthly body. This is Paul Paul writing. Um. <laughs> <laughs> the one who wrote Galatians, <laughs> he wrote that. Okay, uh, so yeah, we're all going to stand before God, um, but he's saying to be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. Okay, so while that might be true, what does that really look like? You know, because Jesus tells a parable, and he talks about Lazarus dying, being carried away by the angels to Abraham's side, or Abraham's bosom, okay? So... In that particular situation, it makes it look like there is a paradise or some sort of place where Abraham and the dead, uh, the people of faith, are residing. And then they can actually see this other place that's burning with hellfire, okay? Where the ruler, where the one who is the master of Lazarus was actually taken, and he was burning. The Bible says he wanted Lazarus. He told Abraham, Abraham, please send Lazarus to me to dip some water onto my tongue. And Abraham says, the chasm between us is too great. Let's just go find that one, okay? Um, the rich man and Lazarus. Luke chapter 16. Hey, Mark, Luke chapter 16. Google's amazing. 
You can teach a Bible study without perforation. <laughs> oh, gosh. Only if you're really in the Word, though. Because you can't, like, pull this stuff out of your, out of your rear end right. if you don't study the Word. Um, <clears throat> Luke chapter 16, verse 19. Jesus said there was a certain rich man who was splendidly clothed in purple and in fine linen and who lived each day in luxury. At his gate lay a poor man named Lazarus who was covered with sores. As Lazarus lay there longing for scraps from the rich man's table, the dogs would come and lick his open sores. Finally, the poor man died and was carried by the angels. So angels carry you away after you die to sit beside Abraham at the heavenly banquet. The rich man also died and was buried and he went to the place of the dead. They're in torment. Now, notice there's no judgment here. There's no judgment here. They just go to two different places immediately. And then listen to this. He saw Abraham in the far distance with Lazarus at his side. The rich man shouted, Father Abraham, have pity. Send Lazarus over here to dip the, the tip of his finger to wait to walk in water and cool my tongue. I'm in anguish in these flames. But Abraham said to him, Son, remember that during your lifetime you had everything you wanted, and Lazarus had nothing. So now he is here being comforted, and you are in anguish. Besides, there is a great chasm separating us. No one can cross over to you from here, and no one can cross over to us from there. Then the rich man died. Or then, then the rich man said, <clears throat> Please, Father Abraham, at least send him to my father's home. For I have five brothers, and I want him to warn them so they don't end up in this place of torment. But Abraham said, Moses and the prophets are warned, have warned them. Your brothers can read what they wrote. The rich man replied, No, Father Abraham, but if someone is sent to them from the dead, then they will repent of their sins and turn to God. But Abraham said, If they won't listen to Moses and the prophets, then they won't be persuaded even if someone rises from the dead. Now, couple things to note about this parable uh i think he's talking about a parable but i think he's talking about a truth and that one of those truths is the fact that there is a place of torment that comes before judgment because he doesn't talk about judgment here the angels the angels separated them now now there's another part where god said where jesus said when they were fishing he said it'll be like this on the day of judgment or on the last day let's find it Okay, Romans chapter, or Matthew chapter 13, verse 49. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a fishing net that was thrown in the water and caught fish every, of every kind. When the net was full, they dragged it up onto the shore, sat down and sorted the good fish into crates, but threw the bad ones away. That is the way it will be at the end of the world. The angels will come and separate the wicked from people from the righteous, throwing the wicked into the fiery furnace where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Do you understand all these things? Yes, they said, and I would be like, no, I don't understand. Help me understand some more because what happens when we die? You know, because you're telling us about this thing that's going to happen <laughs> later. What, so it says, the kingdom of heaven is like a fit. Okay, so the kingdom of heaven is like this. It's not talking about the last day. It's talking about the last day. When the, when the net was full, hold on. It's like a fishing net that was thrown in the water and caught fish of every kind. When the net was full, they dragged it into the shore, sat down and sorted the fish into crates, but, but threw the bad ones away. That is the way it will be at the end of the world. Okay, it is at the end of the world. That is the way it will be at the end of the world. Yeah, Matthew chapter 13, verse 47. <laughs> Forty-seven through fifty-two. Yes, they said we do. Then he added, "Every teacher of religious law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner who brings from his storehouse new gems of truth as well as old." I think he was prophesying about Paul the apostle there, <laughs> because none of his disciples were were astute. None of them were studied, right? They were all fishermen. They were all regular people. But he is saying, every teacher of religious law who becomes a disciple in the kingdom of heaven is like a homeowner who brings from his storehouse new gems of truth as well as old. So I think that's pretty cool. But anyway, what's the point here? The angels separate the good from the bad. So they, just, they, they execute the judgment of God. Well, I find it interesting that this is talking about the end of the world when he does this. But then 
when he tells his parable about Lazarus and the rich man, it seems that the angels did that before that judgment day because the rich man said, go back to my brothers and preach to them the truth so they won't end up here too. So there is some form of almost like a pre-judgment, it seems, before the end judgment, right? Where Lazarus, where the rich man is begging for, 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 for this guy to be resurrected from the dead and go back and preach the gospel, right? So it seems to me <clears throat> that we go to a place of comfort, right? Or we go to a place of torment. Now, this is also the reason why I believe, and this is my personal belief, and I don't think I have it fully understood either. I'm just showing you what I know, okay? I don't have it all. I don't got to figure it out, to be honest with you. I'm just telling you what I know, okay? And I hope it helps you. We know, so, so what is it we do know? Let's talk about what we do know. <clears throat> so what do we do know? We do know that there's a place of comfort and a place of torment. And we go there before the end time. Because the rich man, the rich man's brothers were still alive. All right? So that, that, that clears that up a little bit. Don't you agree? That helps, I think. <laughs> but it's not the final judgment. And this is where we get into things like purgatory and stuff like that. And a lot of people will think the Catholic Church is off about some of these things, but to be honest with you, if we just read our Bibles, we might also agree with a little bit of what they're saying. And I don't ever study any Catholic stuff, okay? I never went to Catholic school. I don't study Catholic stuff. I just study the Bible, and this is what I'm, this is what I'm deducing. Deducing. <laughs> Deducing. <laughs> Deducing. <laughs> Deductive reasoning tells me that they went to a place called Abraham's bosom. It's not even a place called Abraham's bosom. It just says to Abraham's bosom, which means it went to his side. It went to be near Abraham, wherever he was. Okay. What we do know about Abraham's side, Abraham's bosom, is that it is a place of comfort. That's what we do know. It's a place of comfort because the poor man was comforted. Then there was another place that they could see, but they couldn't get to, that was a place of torment. Whatever you want to call it. You can call it heaven or hell. It doesn't really matter to me. What we do know is what happens there. Make sense? Comfort or torment. Okay? Very clear. What we also understand is... <clears throat> Angels separate us, wicked from good. We, in the same parable of the tares, like it talks about the same thing, right? It says the angels will come and pick out the weeds from the tares or whatever, or the weeds from the good stuff, right? So we know that angels separate us. And we also know that there is another judgment, a great white throne judgment. And there actually could be more than one judgment, to be honest with you. <clears throat> and the only reason why I know this is because the book of Enoch talks about it. And I'm not trying to get into the book of Enoch here, because I like to stick to the scripture only, and we don't accept the, the, the book of Enoch as scripture, but script, the Enoch does have some things that seem to explain some things for us. And it talks about this. It talks about how there's a paradise and a, a prison, a paradise and a prison. Okay, and that, that they wait there for the judgment. Okay, they wait there for the judgment. Okay, so even if you don't read the book of Enoch, you can still deduct this information, deductive reasoning, even from what you're teaching, what, what Jesus is teaching, right? That they were separated, went to a place of comfort, and went to a place of, of torment, right? But then we know that the scripture teaches us that they will all be raised again. So this is before the resurrection. So what is the resurrection? We know that there is a resurrection going to happen that everybody will be resurrected, some to life and some to death. 
Okay? So, <clears throat> let's go here. Let's go, let's look up, an, I believe it's in the book of Revelation. Revelation. Well, let's go over to, uh, I think it's at the end of Thessalonians. I love how they talk about these things sometimes. Like, you have no, uh, when uh, it says, concerning end times, you have no need for us to speak about. I'm thinking, yes, we do. <laughs> like, what's wrong? It's because he's been telling them in person what's going on, but he hasn't, didn't think about all us. Verse 13, is that where you're at? And now, dear brothers and sisters, we want you to know what will happen to the believers who have died. So you will not grieve like people who have no hope. For since we believe that Jesus died and was raised to life again, we also believe that when Jesus returns, God will bring back with him the believers who had died. Now that says he'll be bring back with him. That's, That's interesting. We, <clears throat> we tell you this directly from the Lord. We who are still alive when the Lord returns will not meet him ahead of those who have died. Does that make sense? It says, we will not meet him ahead of those who have died. Apparently, the ones who have died will meet Christ before they come back for us. Okay? For the Lord himself will come down from heaven with a commanding shout with the voice of the archangel and with the trumpet call of God. First, the believers who have died will rise from their graves. It didn't say they would come from heaven. Yeah. It says they will rise from their graves. Then together with them, we who are still alive, remain on the earth, will be caught up in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air. Then we will be with the Lord forever. So encourage each other with these words. So this is very clear that there is not a unification with Christ, it seems, until he returns for his bride. And we will all go with each other to meet him. In that moment. Dang. But like once we die, though, like, like you could be past like time. Yes, that's <clears throat> what I said. Yeah. She. Unless it's like, unless it's like, uh, what's his name, the rich man in, in torment. He was very aware of what was happening. Yeah. <laughs> so that, so even if you die, you have time to repent. No, I don't know if that's true or not. I don't think there's any biblical evidence that proves that you can repent because if it had, it would have shown that the rich man would have repented right then. He would have said, he was asking for mercy. He was asking just for a, a drop of water. And he was denied that even. So I'm not really sure if there is any hope for someone after that. Um, also, it does say that when Jesus died, he went down to the prison to preach, right? But, but what was the point in that? Was it, it doesn't really say there that he gave them the opportunity to repent and be saved. It just says he preached. And so here's the reason why I say this. So preaching doesn't necessarily mean repentance is taking place. Preaching means that, <clears throat> for instance, uh, I mean, unless you can find it where he preached to them so they could repent. Because preaching doesn't mean you, you, you can repent. Um, if uh, Back in the day, when they would conquer a, a, a city or a nation, they would take the king of that nation and they would strap him up to a chains and a pole or whatever, right? And they would parade him through the town, through the, the city that they had conquered. And if it was a king of an empire, they would parade him throughout the empire. Okay? And it was, a, it was not, it was, it was more or less an announcement that victory had been won and that the old king was vanquished. So when Jesus went to preach to the prisoners, the spirits in prison, I don't know if he was giving them opportunity to repent or not. I think he was going to show them who won. Okay? Um, <clears throat> and that's the thing. We, we live today in this world. I, I have commented on something the other day uh, on Facebook yesterday. Um about some things. Somebody had talked about, well, if it's illegal for a woman to get an abortion, then they should make it illegal for a man to leave a woman when he's given her a baby, when he impregnated her with a baby. And I just commented, I said, yeah, it's called marriage. That's, what, that's why we have marriage. So you're bound to the man, to, so the man's bound to the woman and the child, you know. Uh, but we, we want to do away with all that, you know. And we want to have sex with no, with no consequences. So then all these people, and I never even mentioned the Bible. I never mentioned religion. I didn't even mention my faith. I just mentioned the truth of what marriage is supposed to be. And people commented, 
oh, your religion. And they started attacking me and not even knowing who I am or, or I never even said anything about the Bible. Uh, started attacking religion, started attacking, you know, it's <clears throat> truth. And uh, I'm looking at them and these people are like, yeah, yeah, if God's real, you know, whatever, they're, they're all, you know, messed up. And I'm realizing, you know what it is, is the parading of the enemy is for those people. Yeah. So whenever someone lived their whole life thinking that they had it all figured out and not submitting to God, then when God comes and parades the devil before them and says, look, the one you served all your life, you didn't know it was him. Whoa. And now, now I'm here and anyone who's not living for me, because that's the thing about it is we have to remember that this world was hijacked. It belongs to God. He's just coming back for it. Mm. It's not like it was the devil's and then, no, no, it, it, the devil was ruling and reigning on it. But God's coming to take it back. You see what I'm saying? And we've forgotten who we really are. Who, we've forgotten who we really belong to, who this world really belongs to. It's like <clears throat> people, they, they have this mindset in their brain, oh, well, this is my life, and I'm the one who's the... I'm in charge. I'm in charge. I'm the <laughs> des- master of my destiny. But you don't get it. You're, 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 you're borrowing someone else's property. Don't you get it? Like, you don't belong to yourself. And the, the, quack, the quicker we can figure that out, the quicker we can figure the quicker we can figure that out, the quicker we can humble ourselves and repent. It, it, this is not our life. This belongs to God. The whole thing belongs to God. And we are we are. Does that make sense? Yeah. It's like if I had a house and somebody squatted on the property, and said, "Look, I've been here for 15 years. This is mine." And then the actual owner of the house comes back and says. Uh, this is my house. What are you doing here? You know? And they see that it was taken care of, and nice and neat. They say, okay, look, I'll let you live here. Just pay me some rent. Hmm. Right? No big deal. But you came and destroyed the place, you're going to get the boot. You see what I'm saying? You're going to get the boot. <laughs> Why? It's not your house. You see what I'm saying? Yeah. Am I making sense? Yeah. Does this help a little bit? Yeah, a lot. <clears throat> um, I don't know. I hope I helped a little bit today. We, we went over a lot of things. Did I answer your question? Yeah. You think it was adequate enough? So on the last day, the Bible says that when he judges the earth, in the book of Revelations, it says he takes death and Hades, and he casts them into the lake of fire. I believe that death and Hades are the place of comfort and the place of torment. This is my personal opinion. <clears throat> death is the place of comfort, and Hades, I believe, is the, is the place of torment. Wait, wait, I thought death was the devil. <clears throat> well, it says he, he took them and he threw them. Also, a lot of times, places are named after people. So Egypt, the word Egypt is actually named after a person, Egypt. Okay? Israel was named after a person, yeah. Israel. Right? Um, so I believe that the place of torment and the place of paradise is also possibly named after a person we know apollyon is the is the devil is a is a demon or a angelic being is the angel of the bottomless pit apollyon it's two names the one that has the other fallen angels some of the fallen angels bound i have no idea right i don't know this isn't in revelation i don't know if apollyon is a good guy or bad guy Hmm. i can't tell Correct. So, so a person of judgment, <clears throat> we think is if I believe God makes Himself ter- a terrible to the wicked, and He makes Himself merciful to the to the to the good, to the righteous. Right. So same with cops. Right. Think about that. I I don't have a problem with cops. I like cops. I'm glad we have cops. Anyone who does bad things though, they hate cops. <laughs> Right? They're terrified of him. Oh, there's a cop. I remember having one of the students <laughs> come to the barracks, and, and he's like, uh, Zach. He's, he car. says, no, well, not that guy. No. Uh, it was Kurt, <laughs> Kurt Thomas. He's like, Zach, it's so weird to not be nervous about cops anymore. Yes. That's yeah. what it is with me. Is that's why I like joking. Like, I see the cops. Like, because uh, <laughs> first time he was very, oh, there's a cop. And then after a while, he's like, <laughs> I don't have to be scared. And so there's a cop that drove up one time and, and uh, waved at him and he walked right up to the cop and talked to him and asked him his questions. 
And he came back to me and goes, Zach, I never would have done that before. Yeah. Right? So the same with God. I believe that God is, you know, a blessing to those who are righteous, but a terror to those who are wicked. Yeah. Make sense? So same with any of God's forms of judgment, too. This is why the Bible says, oh, but that day will not come to us like a thief in the night. Because we have nothing to fear because we are in God. We are in Christ. All of our sins have been washed away. We have nothing to worry about. We don't have to worry about the judgment of God. You see what I'm saying? But those who are not in Christ have a lot to fear. And this is the reason why they want to they eradicate God from everything. Because they're afraid. They're afraid, if God is real, what that means for them. Thank you.